get going then. Uh, happy Wednesday, everyone. Uh, is there anybody new on the call that would like to introduce themselves to the group? Hi, I'm Vlad. I'm new to the call. <laughs> Hi, Vlad. Nice to meet everybody. Uh, anybody else? Nope. Okay. Um, George, how are we looking for host of the community meeting? We are good for the next two weeks, but uh, we're running a little thin going into the summer. So anyone who wants to volunteer to host a community meeting, if you've never done it before, I can walk you through it, that sort of thing. Um, uh, I, I raised my hand. Yeah, I think you signed up. You signed up for one, didn't you? No, not yet. Oh. But yeah, I, I can definitely do it um, in three or four weeks. Okay. Yeah, um, I will. I will send you the link to the spreadsheet where you can volunteer yourself. Excellent. Beautiful. Okay. Uh, graph for the community meeting of the week. Is there anybody who has something that they they would like to show off? No, and um, we weren't able to meet yesterday, so we didn't have anything to talk about. Um, well, we had stuff to talk about, but we weren't able to meet yesterday. Uh, so um, I will take that off of the agenda item then for the community meeting. Um, so um, the next agenda item is a reminder that Kayla Miles will be intro um, introing the KEP at the community meeting tomorrow. Um, does anybody want to give um, a little bit more backstory on that? Maybe George? Which, which KEP? Yeah, I'm curious. Yeah, so he's actually going to do an introduction to the KEP process itself. Okay. Sort of like an intro, and then from then on, we'll have like a little section that's like, this week, here's two KEPs that were submitted. Here's two that were closed. This KEP's open and closed for discussion, that sort of thing, to kind of give more visibility to KEPs. But um, I think him and Joe had lunch, and, and I had given them feedback that, like, I've contributed to two KEPs, and I still am not clear on the process. So we should just, like, explain baseline to everybody at the call what exactly a KEP is, where to find them, that sort of thing, to get everyone on the same sheet of music. And then the week after, we'll go into to caps so great um so looking forward to that if you're curious about the cap process tune in tomorrow uh okay and then tomorrow security uh contacts uh who has um insight into this one um, I just added it to the agenda because I know we were discussing it last week and I saw stuff drive by uh, on GitHub and I was wondering, are we all set? That was mostly a question for Christoph. Like, I think we're all set as far as security contacts. For our SIG, I mean, not, or is it the whole repo? I'm not sure. And he could be AFK, so I don't know. <laughs> Christoph or Garrett, do you have um, insight into that? Sorry, what was the question? I apologize. Uh, are we all set for the security contacts in our repo? Do you know? Uh, I don't know. That's probably a better question for Christoph if he is here. Hi, sorry, I was muted. Can you hear me? Oh, hey. Yes. Hey. Um, yeah, so as far as the community repo is concerned, yeah, we're set. Uh, I'm not super worried because there isn't a lot of code that, that has security implications in our repo anyways. Um, I know um, uh, Jess Rizal from the, the product security team has gone and opened up issues against every repo in Kubernetes um, to get that file added to every other repo. So that process is kind of underway for all the other repos. Um, but for the community one specifically, yeah, we're set. Do we document that process? Is that like the file that's needed? Uh, yeah, there was a there was a PR and a file that was added to uh, our repo. I can I'm, I'm mobile right now, but I can dig up the the PR and send it over to you. Okay, I think you so, received feed on it. 
Thanks, Chris. I'm I'm a little unclear on how this is supposed to work if some party actually discovers a security problem in Kubernetes code um, or in, in one of the other repos. Um, so we have at kubernetes.io slash security, uh, we have, there's a very detailed page that lists like what we consider a security vulnerability, who to contact and what information to include. Um, so yeah, that's out of kubernetes.io slash security. All these files, these security contact files in all the repos also say, this is not a public disclosure path. Please use kubernetes.io slash security. That's the right, the right place to go. And the, the process is detailed there too, but at a very high level, it's the, the information gets disclosed to the product security team. Uh, the product security team kind of has a rotation of who's on point to deal with a security issue. So there's always somebody from that team that is able to respond in a timely manner. They triage the issue. Um, and, and figure out like how impactful is it and who do we need to bring in to be able to fix it. Um, and then they kind of proceed from there and depending on the type of vulnerability and the, the severity, they will either give heads up to uh, distributors that like, hey, you know, uh, Red Hat or GKE, you should go and like, we're disclosing this and be prepared for a patch to, 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 to drop. Um, so there's all the, all the little details of what that process looks like are all kind of laid out there in, in Kubernetes.io slash security. Okay. These files are very specifically so that the product security team knows like who, like users specifically that are responsible for the code and that who, and that those users have already like read and agreed to the embargo policy so that if they are disclosing information, those people, these are the people who will uphold the embargo and be able to like triage an issue to get, get it fixed. These are, these are just internal contacts. The, the public stuff is always Kubernetes.io slash security. Yep. The, um, okay. So the idea is that the difference between this and the contents of the owner's file is just that people have read the embargo procedures and agreed to them. Yes, basically. Thank you, Christoph. Um, it looks like Vlad is up next um, on the agenda with installing uh, Focal on Kubernetes Slack. Hey guys, uh, yeah. So uh, I, I don't know. I don't, I don't kind of don't know how to go at uh, approaching your introduction here, but like, so uh, I saw uh, a while ago there was this uh, thing called Pensive on uh, or Pensive. I, I don't know uh, how Harry Potter people pronounce it. Um, there's a, uh, so there was an extension on the Slack channel, which basically tries to automatically answer questions for you. Um, I actually, I saw that it was, you know, up for a few, for like a few weeks and then just kind of never went anywhere. Uh, and I was kind of watching that because I actually have a very similar extension that I've been building for the last few months. Um, the one interesting thing though, is that like, I've been, uh, I've been part of this community for like, well, part of the Slack channel for, you know, something like eight months or so at this point. And, uh, what I've been using to train my, uh, my model or like my actual chat bot was, you know, one of the most, uh, uh, one of the most active Slack channels, which is the, the Kubernetes Slack channel, right? Uh, so what I'm trying to propose is, uh, you know, putting this uh, extension onto um, the Kubernetes Slack. So, the, I mean, the basic idea is that it's it's about, like, answer trying to automatically answer questions for people. Like, if somebody new comes on the, the channel, uh, they don't know something, they ask a question. Uh, I mean, if you look at um, the current... Uh, you know, channels and look at the current questions, there's a million questions that are just never answered. And you can look at it that a lot of them probably can be. Um, I, I don't know, I can share screen and do a demo. Or so I, I kind of did like a video or I, I posted a link to the video there if it's a little bit easier to do. Um, uh, should I share screen or just yeah, kind of like, go for okay, it. Yeah. Uh, one second. So, um, so I mean, I kind of like pre-create. Oh, I don't know, can you guys see anything? Oh, there we go. Um, still trying. Still frozen. Yeah. Can't. Says so that you started screen sharing, but I can't see a screen yet. 
There we go. There we go. There we go. Yep. So, um, I mean, I, I kind of pre, you know, pre-created this example just in case, cause you know, I, I get nervous in front of uh, demos, I guess. But, uh, so the basic idea is that like somebody comes on this channel, asks a simple question. Like, for example, I ask like, Hey, where do I find the, you know, vocal terms of service? And, uh, based on previous conversations, this was already stored. So this will come up, um, you know, this will come up with like an automatic answer. Like, Hey, have you tried any of these things before? Uh, and then you could say yes, and it'll be kind of useful for us. Also, if you click yes, it will kind of let the channel know, like, hey, this conversation has already been answered, or this uh, this question has already been answered. Or, you know, click no, and then I'll know that, you know, that stuff is not useful, and then I'll try not to show it up as much anymore. Um, so the basically where this kind of content comes from is uh, one of two places. So the first place is uh, additionally from other conversations. Ah, crap. Oh, there it is. So... Um, you know, again, this is just like a conversation I kind of had with myself earlier uh, on a test channel. Uh, you know, I kind of said like, hey, where's the privacy policy? I had like a support connection, just say like, hey, check out this channel. And then, uh, you know, like, so what happens is basically the extension will figure out that this is like a useful conversation. Um, so as you imagine, like people are talking through the, uh, through the channel uh, you know, this thing will pop up every once in a while, like, Hey, this useful, this like seems like a useful question and answer. Can we store this in the future? So the idea is that like, yeah, this thing will detect this. If it's an important question, you click yes. Um, at some point it loads, I guess Slack is a little slow today. Yeah. <laughs> Give it a second. There it is. So what it does is it like tries to understand the question, tries to kind of summarize it, and then it says, "Hey, you know, like this is an answer." So then what the person can do is say, like, you know, maybe remove some of the you know clutter text that's un unnecessary. You know, like this is kind of unnecessary, right? And then just click store, and then it'll store the conversation or store the context, and then the future will show up. So th this is the first source of uh, this kind of information. And then the second source would be uh, then scraping something like Kubernetes, uh, uh, you know, the documentation or uh, just Stack Overflow or something and kind of, you know, inject the same kind of information. So I guess, that's so that's kind of the idea. I, I guess, like, you know, I, I reached out to George. He mentioned that I should uh, talk to you guys about this and see what uh, you guys think. And I'll stop sharing them. Done. So I, it looks good to me. We've got um, on some IRC channels I'm on for older projects, we have IRC bots that work a lot like this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think this is really cool uh, and definitely helps to answer the, the standard questions that come up all the time. Um, uh, I think tools like these are, are great, definitely. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and I also think it ties kind of into the, the conversation we had a few weeks ago, George, uh, around um, what's it called, Donut, um, meeting people online in Slack. Uh, it's another Slack integration as well. Um, so if you have a question and it might not get answered, then you might be paired up with someone who actually can answer that question. Mm -hmm. That's actually one of the, uh, the the features of kind of like working on in the short term is um, by using this, you can kind of figure out who the experts are of certain topics. And then um, if a topic is understood, but the actual answer is not known, it, it, you know, the, the hope over a couple of months or over the short term is to figure out like, okay, maybe I don't know the answer, but hey, have you tried talking to this person? This person might know. Yeah. And by kind of facilitating that question and answer, you actually have more information about like, okay, well, this person knew the answer, but then now I can actually see that conversation and record that conversation as well. Very cool. So I have a few questions. Vlad, you and I talked about this uh, some length, so I'm just going to repeat some of the questions for the for everyone else. Yep. Um, so with Pensy, which, by the way, we, we tried that and we needed 100 factoids or whatever to kick off the machine learning. And we only ever got to like 24 and then they gave up um, because there was a lot of noise. However, the way that was structured is Bob, who couldn't be at today's meeting and I would get a ton of questions and then we would individually go through them. It sounds like this flips it the other way around is you're depending on the users of the channel to say, okay, someone answered me. I craft the question. 
So it's, it's on the answerer. It's like whoever answered the question is probably the most knowledgeable about that topic. Okay. will be the one that will get that notification that says like, hey, do you, you know, is this the right answer? Or uh, hey, do you want to store this answer? Okay. And just so we're clear, all the, all, every time it's prompting a user, it's doing that ephemerally. So it's not yep. polluting the channel, right? Yep. Okay. Yeah. So the only messages it does actually send is that if you, um, if you uh, get a question, like, if like you ask me a question and then I, you know, I get a, or sorry, if uh, I ask you a question and then I get a, a notification like, Hey, this, you know, have you tried this? If I click yes, then it will notify the channel that my question was answered so that you're not, you know, so other people aren't trying to answer my question. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, uh, yeah, this, this is really cool. Just, just quick questions. Uh, one of the thing is, uh, you know, when people ask questions, many times there are multiple people who respond. Right. So many times the answer is not just like a, you know, a one single answer. It's like a discussion. Mm -hmm. And, you know, uh, then eventually there's like, oh, okay, I got it now. Right. Um, you know, for something like Stack Overflow, for example, where, you know, people like 10, 10 people answer it and, and the user say, hey, this is the right answer. So I know this is the one, you know, satisfy the user's need. Right. And that's the answer. Uh, <clears throat> ideally, you want to show it to uh, as response to the question. Right? Mm -hmm. So how, I mean, how, with the tool, I'm just wondering uh, what, what would be the sort of consideration for, for that kind of, uh, you know, questions. Gotcha. Yeah, it's a good question, actually. Uh, so what we're doing, uh, so what we do is we um, monitor not just like question and answer. What we do is we like kind of detect a question and we monitor the entire conversation um, so that we, we are kind of like the goal of this thing is like figure out like where is that conversation where it's like people are discussing what is the right approach and finally when that kind of we are thinking that that conversation is over based on some heuristics and some other data uh, we actually summarize that conversation and we try to remove all the unimportant stuff and we show that message of like do you think we should store this conversation we show it basically to the most active user that's not the person asking the question it's, it's kind of gotcha. a simple solution. Somebody so, will be even verified by someone, right? Yeah. So, I mean, we'll basically no. summarize this thing, show it to a person that's the most like active person in that conversation and get them a summary and say, hey, can you summarize this? The other side of that is like if people are talking and um, we're not like sure of, you know, if they're like new to the channel, they might not know about this yet or something like that. We can uh, whitelist it to only certain people are able to add questions while everybody gets answers. Cool. Thanks. Yeah, I'd I'd vote against uh, whitelisting unless we actually encounter a problem. Um, yeah. And about how large of a corpus have you collected? Like, well, I mean, so your like the questions for this channel will be some completely independent of every other one. No, I meant like, have you been indexing like Kubernetes users this whole time? Oh, or? so no, I mean, I, I basically what I do is like uh, I'll steal like. 10,000, 100,000 lines. Uh, I think the biggest dump I got was like uh, a couple hundred thousand lines of just Kubernetes users. Okay. So if we turn this on, is it one of those things that we have to turn it on, then wait a while? Or is uh, it? No. So, I mean, you don't have to wait a while. Uh, as soon as there's question, as soon as there's like stored answers, I can start answering those things. It's just about like, uh, like, because of this is, uh, you know, fairly new, I want to kind of do it slowly, not because of, uh, it, like, I just don't want to annoy the crap out of people, right? So mm -hmm. I want to make sure that the relevance is up. I want to make sure that it's it's good. So maybe in the beginning, we'll try to, you know, make it so that it doesn't show up as often, that it doesn't uh, doesn't show up as many, or doesn't answer as many times because, you know, we'll turn up the relevance all the way so that it's, it's really, really sure that the answer is the right answer before it shows somebody an answer, you know? What I mean? So in the beginning, we'll be a little slow, but uh, hopefully we can kind of like, the, the, the goal of this is to kind of understand the tweaks or understand the, Kind of the community, how it works, like tweak it to, to make it work for the community. Mm -hmm. I think that's a good approach, kind of slowly ramping it up. Yeah, as long as it's not spamming by default and it's doing all the learning in the background, then yeah. So I'm generally a plus one to this because I, I really, I used the, the Pensy bot a lot, even though a lot of the factoids were like for my own personal, they were like, what time is a community meeting? I mean, they were just silly questions like that, that I just used in ContribX. Um, but I, I, I think that we definitely uh, would need to write, there's like some details we should go over, right? Like who owns the data, you know? Yep. 
that kind well, of I mean, stuff. So like, yeah, definitely you guys own the data. I mean, I have like, you know, the full terms of service and privacy policy if, if you if you care about any of that stuff. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess the only kind of question with all this stuff is with the world being part of GDPR. I don't know if you guys have uh, yeah. have considered, like, I don't know how that Slack channel kind of works in terms of like, you know, if you have somebody in the UK that leaves the Slack channel, what do you guys do? Yeah, I, d I don't know. I was kind of hoping we weren't going to talk about GDPR. <laughs> we <laughs> no. did last week. So. Sorry. Um, yeah. Um, so, yeah, that, I mean, to me, it feels like those are just crossing the T's and dotting the I. I mean, I think we should take this probably to the mailing list. Um, I agree. Yeah, get feedback as Paris is in here in a few and just kind of outline what you want to do. I'm generally plus one. Like I, I was telling in PM, even if it's only terrible and gets, you know, a few hundred or something interceptions a day, let's say, that's like, it, it can help a lot of people. As I was going through the questions, there's just so much unanswered stuff that just gets churned through that channel. It was like, even if worst case, all it does is like, hey, I noticed no one's answered your question. Go post on Stack Overflow. That would be like way better than right now. We just, people just tend to get ignored. So I'm, I'm generally plus one. Um, cool. So basically the action item here is to go and just post this to the, to the group and just kind of collect some comments and then just kind of follow up with you offline. Yeah, yeah, and then what we did is I think we turned it on for for Pensieve. I think we turned it on for novice first. Uh, then we noticed we weren't getting any data and then turned it on for users, and then we still weren't getting any good data. Um, so I don't know. We might want to try Contribax channel first maybe with some of our stuff um, or, or not. Probably novice first, I think, because that's only a few thousand. How many, how many people are in novice? And we could do some, uh, some basic questions. Yeah. Um, we can also do some basic questions in there, um, put some basic stuff. If you want to do the, the country backs, uh, I can, I can definitely spam with a bunch of newbie questions since I'm, I'm still a newbie. Uh, yeah. so I can do that and then we, we can collect answers there as well. Right. Because at a minimum, at a minimum, I mean, individual SIG channels and stuff, this could be useful too. Like, where's our charter? Like if it's like, if it acts like a, you know, like a, like, can you PM the thing? Like, can I just PM it and just ask it questions? <laughs> or is uh, it? It, it's actually like a very simple feature that is just, I was like, yeah, I'll add it at some point. I just haven't. <laughs> oh, okay. I was just curious. Okay, cool. Yeah, um, yeah one other thing I was just curious was uh, who is behind the focal? I know uh, yourself, but is it a community, just yourself? <laughs> uh, I mean, it's a it's an it's a corporation awesome. and it's a, you know, basically mostly owned by me corporation. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, because I was just wondering when you send, uh, uh, you know, uh, sort of an email on the mailing list. That's one of the things I think people want to know, right? Uh, and, and and you know, in future as well, like the, the sort of you know, uh, uh, enhancement to the to the tool, to plugin or maintenance or whatnot, right? I think once you learn about it. So. Gotcha. Sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Great. So if you could uh, send that out on the mailing list, that would be great. Great, will do, thanks. Uh, Jonas, I think you're up next. Yeah, uh, excellent. I actually see that Noah Abrams is on the call as well, so maybe he wants to talk about this. But um, I just wanted to say that the non-dev guide meeting that we talked about a few weeks ago and at KubeCon, uh, the first meeting is now scheduled for June, June 5th at 1.30 p.m. EST, and then you can... I convert that into PDT or whatever you want to do. Uh, but it's essentially um, documenting all the non-coding roles of the project and how to help out with those. And uh, starting with a section in the contributor guide, and there are a bunch of different um, interested people uh, for this. So if, if you um, want to be a part of this, make sure that you reach out to Noah as well. Um, so is the meeting posted on the community calendar? That, Mm, we haven't really formally figured out what we're going to do, whether it's going to be a, a project or a working group, or if it's just four people on a Zoom or what. So um, we're just throwing it out here to gauge interest, make sure everybody that has some idea wants, uh, that wants to be involved can get involved. 
and then we'll probably expand it once we get past our first, okay, what are we actually going to do? Uh, my question was more along the lines of um, how would people join this meeting? Like, do you, like, where's the link? Like, would they like PM you to, to get an invite to the meeting? Would, right now, how would you like them a, to do that? a Slack chat with like five of us in it. <laughs> so, okay. uh, PM me or Jonas or, I can I can put in the the link here uh, in the doc as well if you want. That'd be great. Thank you. Yep, will do. Okay, Christoph, label descriptions update. Hey, uh, yeah. So I just wanted to pull everybody's attention towards two PRs. Um, one I'm hoping to merge fairly soon, and one I need to send out messages to. Uh, the mailing list and and seek like the, do the notifications and stuff. Um, Eighty one twenty eight. Um, I put this in uh, Contribex yesterday. Um, GitHub now supports updating label descriptions, like first class label descriptions via the API. They didn't before. Uh, you had to go through the UI to do it. So now that they support it through the API, we can actually push a lot of the descriptions that Aaron had writ written. We can actually push them up to the API, uh, and they display when you look at the label list. It's it's pretty. Um, so I, I'm going to do that. Um, I needed to like edit down some descriptions because there's a character limit of 100 characters, uh, and some of them were very wordy. Um, so uh, the code itself has been reviewed and tested, and I've actually already pushed out it out to community itself. Um, but I'm going to push the button and roll it out to everybody. But if anybody wants to review those label descriptions and maybe make suggestions on better ways to word it, because some of them are, they have to be very terse um, to, to, to fit in the 100 character limit. So anybody wants to review that, I would appreciate that. That's the uh, 8128 PR. Uh, 8129 is um, the taking the GitHub default labels and it actually migrates them to what our equivalent of them is. So when you create a new repo, like it'll create a repo called uh, the label called bug. Um, but we actually use kind slash bug uh, to denote the same thing. So that 8129 migrates one label to the other and creates a description for it and uh, basically makes it a first class label as far as our, our label syncing tool. Um, uh, but that one, because it will affect existing labels on, on repos, like actually migrating and changing what a label is called, I need to get notifications out for that. So I'm probably going to send that out uh, before the end of this week and then take a look at merging that next week. Um, and then hopefully we'll be in a good place. Like I, I, you know, we might not be able to do the, um, Josh was bringing it up yesterday. We might not be able to do like the priority failing test stuff because of the, the, um, the way the milestone munger for the release team is set up. Uh, but we might be able to move some of the other like kind support and that kind of stuff into their, their final spots as well as good first issue. I want to get good first issue, um, uh, out out there so we can start using that move that one along i mean i'll say the one change that required extra bits where i would rather wait until we've disabled the milestone munger in favor of prow and move to tide um is a uh, priority failing test mm -hmm. um the other kind changes really don't affect anything and so those can be implemented at any time and that includes basically blessing two of the kind labels and marking the rest as deprecated um the um so um the um um so um yeah and and more you know for my part is i'm just not going to be able to follow up on these until after the 111 release so um someone else could implement these or they can wait until we release 1.11 and i'll actually get around to finishing them yeah i'm probably going to tackle chasing those the next week and seeing where they're at. I know like, you know, when we were looking at good first issue, um, I can't remember whether it was Gwyn or it was Nikita who was actually looking at implementing the command for it. Um, but the, one of them wanted to tackle that is like, you know, here, here's like an entry point to, to looking at the, the test infra code and, and prow and that kind of stuff. Um, so I'll follow up with 
figure out who, who that was. I'd follow up with them and see if they still have the cycle to, to be able to tackle it. Um, cause I'd like to get those, those labels, those n- labels normalized. The big one being good first issue because there's an increasing number of use cases for it and people that want to use it and new repos actually already come with it. We just don't have the command and infrastructure and isn't integrated with the rest of our tooling to be able to apply that label. Yeah, there's basically two open questions with good first issue um, that just honestly need somebody to make a decision on them um, and write that decision up. Um, one, well, and possibly code it up. So one question is, how does good first issue interact with help wanted? Um, and the second question is, what's going to be our procedure for reviewing, updating, expiring good first issue tagged issues to make sure that we don't end up with, you know, 300 good first issues that are things that are actually way out of date and we don't want implemented. Yeah, the the first the first question seems fairly simple to me. I feel like they should be additive. Like if a if a um, if an issue is marked good first issue, it should also have help wanted because there's callouts in the GitHub UI for help wanted issues. So the two labels I think could be easily additive, and whichever one they search, if somebody's just looking for help wanted, they'll find and notice the ones that also say good first issue. Or if they're searching directly for good first issue, they'll just find those. So I think additive is probably the best thing there. As far as the review process. That I'm not quite sure about whether we should like automatically expire issues out, whether we should nag them, whether we should implement some sort of manual review process. Hey, Gwen. Uh, sorry. Hey, can you all hear me? Am I? No. Yep. Yes. I'm, oh, God, I'm not muted. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, no, I was saying that good first issues. So um, actually what uh, Phil Whitrock has been doing for me is he literally curated three issues for me to get me started on a project. Um, and those labels actually implicitly in this case come with, you know, grouchy support from upstream. <laughs> um, just not grouchy. Sorry, that was the wrong word. Um, I'm really tired. Sorry, guys. Um, they basically what it is is, is a way um, to tie that into getting started on a new repo or a new project. Uh, you know, to have a new contributor cohort, something like that, I think would be really awesome to just kind of tie that in. I know that's asking a little bit more effort from whoever made those issues, right? Because help wanted is like, oh my god, I need help, I can't deal. Um, but something like good first issue might be nice if it also came with like, this is a great way and we will help you grow into the repo. Does that make sense? Um, If we could somehow combine those two efforts, that would be pretty great because it looks like we have this resource for like, well, how are we going to grow like new contributor cohorts and areas? And well, I feel like, you know, good first issues are a natural breeding ground for that sort of thing. Yeah, I think the, the, the two pieces are the, the technical bits to make it happen and have the tooling and that kind of stuff and the policy. Um, and if somebody feels strongly about the policy, like I'd suggest, let's just get, let's get a PR open. Let's get, let's get, let's get some docs around it um, of what, what we want to establish, at least as an initial policy. And we can, it's always, we can go and revisit it later. Um, the, the technical bits of implementing the, the command and getting the label set up and synced across all the repos um, there hasn't been a lot of movement on that. I'm hoping to kind of figure out where that is and shepherd it along and tackle it next week um, so that we can at least have the label established across all of our repos and have a consistent command set in Prow so that org members can actually add it and remove it from, from issues. And then we can start figuring out how, how we're going to use it and how we're going to curate it. And is it being used in the way that we want it to be used? Or do we need to set different policies around it of, of like, what is the minimum bar before you can set good first issue or help wanted for that matter? I, I would submit that good first issue should come with implicit support. I don't disagree with that. Okay, great. Um, 
yeah, again, the, 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 the call to action there is any, if anybody has cycles to review the label description changes in 8128, it's just the one file, the labels.yaml. Um, that would be, that would definitely be helpful. I'm all, if anybody has any last minute changes, I can implement those, but otherwise I'll probably merge by end of day. Great. Thank you, Christoph. And uh, that brings us to George with our last agenda item of the day. Okay, I will go really fast. Um, so part of the campus meet weekly um, sharing the stats. Can you all see that? Mm -hmm. Of the discuss prototype. So everything was going really good, as you can see here from our monthly stats. And then Memorial Day happened and we got crushed. Um, but other than that, the monthly stats are, are looking good as far as user growth. And we are now at about 450 users here. Um, so everything appears to be on track. Uh, one thing I did want to ask is if you have content to post on the site, I'd really appreciate it. So we've been, I've been asking uh, people who have been posting like Kubernetes related announcements. That'd be kind of maybe a little bit too spammy for a Kubernetes developer list. So I've been reaching out to them to post, hey, you can post your announcement here. And a lot of the ecosystem people out there have been posting really classy um, announcements about their products and things like that. So it gives people a place to go. And our cube cuddle um, thread, it's a tips and tri tricks thread, which is on discuss, um, has been really blowing up thanks to some help from the um, CNCF Kubernetes Twitter account. So uh, by far, this has been our most successful thread so far, and there's lots of great information there. Uh, what's really great about this is this is something that will be off topic for Stack Overflow and um, maybe not as easy to grok through if you had to, you know, search through a mailing list archive. So I've learned a lot just by reading this. So if you can think of content or great things to post there, um, uh, stuff like this is just absolute gold for us content wise. And the second most popular this week has been, um, how do I stop sharing? I think I'm done. Uh, Lower right. Oh, there it is. Big red button. Uh, the second one is Justin Garris's post of how has Kubernetes failed for you, which has the second highest number amount of views this week at 845, but no one's posted. So I think people are afraid. Um, so I, I just thought that was, that was kind of interesting. So that's your stats on for the week. And thanks to Josh has been posting a lot of great content lately. Uh, the more, the better. Thank you, In my case, I'm mostly reposting things that I post elsewhere, but this way people can find them. Yeah, I, I think part of the, you know, especially because there is overlap with a lot of the other stuff, I think for now that, that really helps out. And I think I've got some ideas of existing mailing lists that I think can move over pretty well. I'm not quite ready to like rip that Band-Aid off and make a lot of enemies quite yet. So um, just letting the site grow naturally now. Going to add a list to the site. There's a blog post now on the Kubernetes official blog that went live today. So we're going to naturally grow it a little bit um, and, and give give people a reason to go there as opposed to like um, some, some of the other open source projects we looked at, you know, kind of, hey, you're moving and we're shutting the old thing down and that kind of jarred a lot of people. So I don't, I don't know. If, I know some people want to do that, but I don't, I don't know how quite ready we are to make that commitment. But when we are, we'll have stuff there already, which is better than an empty spot, so. Great, thank you, George. Uh, does anybody else have um, something that they would like to discuss? Okay, uh, happy Wednesday, everybody, and we'll see you next week. Bye, everyone. Have a great week. Bye. Bye, everyone.